Okay, so a warm welcome back after what was hopefully a joyful period of service for you all. And uh, let's just sit together quietly for a couple of minutes before I uh, give some reflections for the day. Today I thought I'd talk a bit more about patience and the nutriment or the cause, one of the main causes that I've discovered through my own practice for its arising and a cause that seems to really help sustain um, the patience that's required for really allowing the process of meditation to unfold. I read a definition of patience recently that said the ability to wait for things to become good. And I thought this really applies to the process of meditation. Because quite often we think that the process of meditation happens through a sense of our ability or our will or through the sense of self somehow, how good I am at the practice, how well I've understood And, you know, two of the main causes for impatience are actually wanting things to go really quickly and this sense of self that feels that it has to make it happen. And, you know, we've been conditioned from probably in this world from the first day we were born, (laughs) if not for many lifetimes, to believe that Um, Our will is our friend, our will is our um, ability to choose, our ability to um, acquire, to bring whatever we want into our lives um, in the way that we want to. And yet, according to the Buddha's teaching, it's this sense of self which is um, built through wanting, you know, and which wanting sustains that is actually the problem here. You know, wanting makes us feel alive, right? We want something, so the sense of self gets um, consolidated. And because of the sense of self, we need something to do. And that something to do is an aspect of will, an aspect of wanting. Sometimes this is even to the extent that, you know, we want things that are not good for us. Or we even mess up the things that are good for us by getting involved. Just anything to show that we are in control. I've seen this in my own practice. You know, sometimes we can think that we 
um, you know, we're inclining to wholesome states. And yet when very strong bliss or stillness arises in the mind, sometimes it's a bit too much for the sense of self because we start to feel out of control. We start to feel like something else is, is almost taking over and it gets scary and we interfere just to show that we're still in control. So I want to talk today about how um, patience, when it is founded on confidence in the teachings, can undermine the sense of self and the will, this sense of wanting and desire, and almost supplant them through wisdom so that we can yield to the Dhamma, we can yield to the process of cause and effect. So confidence is a kind of inspiration for me, you know, something that's a source of energy, um, that's founded on some insight, some resonance with the Buddha's teachings, with the teachings particularly the found in the Four Noble Truths. So I don't know how familiar many of you are with the Buddha's teachings, but this is foundational, and the Buddha was mainly concerned with suffering and its end. He taught two things, suffering and the end of suffering, in brief. And it would be curious for me to know how many people here um, were attracted, even to coming to this meditation retreat, by the wish to end suffering, as opposed to how many people here were attracted by the prospect of the end. In other words, were pulled in through the desire for happiness. The two are slightly different, subtly different. But it'd be curious to know, how many people are mostly motivated by a wish to end suffering? Yeah? And how many would you say the main motivation is the search for happiness? Okay, probably two-thirds to a third, which is interesting, probably a little bit more than usual. Often we come through a sense of um, something not being quite right in our lives. It doesn't have to be immense suffering of loss or um, of grief or you know, chronic illness or despair. Sometimes it can just be this sense that something's not quite right. You know, we haven't quite figured out why we're here. We feel a little bit lost. We're not really sure what the direction of our lives is or what the meaning of life is itself. And for me, this was the main motivation for coming to meditation. I wanted to understand why I'm here and how to make sense of this suffering that I feel is not only within me, but all around me. <coughs> you only have to turn on the news to hear about the wars and the terrible things that people do to one another through greed or fear or anger. Please come in. And for me, hearing about this in my teens, I really wondered how I could be immune to that. You know, how come people can watch this news and feel kind of numb or feel like this is normal? For me, there was a problem here, and I wanted to understand how this could be resolved. You know, what could a compassionate response to the suffering in the world look like? Was it even possible to alleviate the suffering in the world? And this led to a great deal of confidence in the Dhamma when I finally heard the teachings and sat for my first retreat. It was as though here was a possibility to get the answers to this burning question of why we suffer and can there be some meaning to this? And uh, the Buddha said, you know, that suffering is a reality. For me, this was such a relief. Someone was finally admitting this, you know, rather than saying, oh, there's something wrong with you. And also that there is a way out. And that way out is through understanding suffering, not by turning away. And it's possible. So many people have done this before. And for me, when I started to meet people who have obviously practiced on this path, what I noticed was that they had this sense of inner peace, a sense of inner joy that hadn't been developed through circumventing suffering, but through understanding suffering. And that suffering uh, engendering very deep compassion you know, for themselves, but also for all beings, because suffering is something universal, it's not something personal. And when we can expand our understanding in this way, then we can become a lot more compassionate and look for a solution that works for everyone. 
So we start to walk on this path and experience some of the results. At first, it's just the confidence that gets us going. You know, something sounds true, something sounds right about this practice. And this enables us to take the first step. But then after we take that step, we start to realize it has benefits in our lives. And this gives us even more inspiration to keep on walking on the path. Instead of wanting, you know, wanting for the results, we start to see that wanting is the cause of suffering. And that when we're able to be content with experience as it manifests right now, then we start to find some relief. And this can be by turning towards that suffering, that distress, that discomfort, or even boredom, tiredness, whatever is manifesting in the mind. And just learning a proper way of relating to it uh, that stops adding on the mental stress. Yeah, so some of suffering is physical. It is um, very real. It's called dukkha dukkha in the Buddha's teachings. Other aspects of suffering are what we add on. They're the psychological elements to suffering. Some of those psychological sufferings, such as depression, can also be caused physiologically. There's definitely a physical element there. But it's the not wanting it, it's the trying to push it away, the discontent that actually strengthens it so much. So the Buddha pointed to the areas where we were suffering, not to make us roll in it, not to you know, give us a sense of doom and gloom, um, but to stimulate this wish in us to find freedom. And this wish to find freedom from suffering, not only for ourselves, but for all beings, you know, to find a universal cure, is the motivation for my practice and that ensues in happiness and peace. So the Buddha was not a killjoy, you know, this was not a, a, a negative message. In fact, it was an incredibly optimistic message that there is such a thing as freedom from suffering. And, you know, he, for many years, practiced austerities, sort of trying to torture and torment the body to find peace. Yesterday in the Q&A, somebody did put a little question to me that I said I'd address today. And it was about the translation of patience as austerity. And I just want to make clear that the Buddha was actually coining the word tapas, which meant austerity, and giving it a new meaning entirely. In India in the ancient days, um, tapas, which literally means a kind of burning away, burning away of something, you know, ideally burning away of the defilements, the things that make us suffer, um, was also understood to be austerity, to be achieved through torturing and tormenting the body, pushing through with force. And the Buddha redefined that word to mean patience. He said that patience is the highest tapas, the highest austerity. In other words, it's not an austerity at all, but it's the antithesis of force. It's something gentle, it's something allowing, it's something that... Um, enables us to see what's going on and to meet it wisely and to have that persistence as well, that consistency that gives things time. So the Buddha tried these extremes of tormenting the body but he also realised that the opposite of sensual indulgence also wasn't the way. <clears throat> Sometimes we can become a bit too relaxed in our practice or we can feel that it's not working and isn't it so often the case that it's when we're kind of bored or we're lacking faith or we're losing the inspiration that we turn on the TV, you know, instead of meditating. Or we go for the kind of chocolate cake over something that would be more healthy for us, even though we know it might, in my case, it would not do me any good and it might actually affect my ability to practice. Um, but we do this when we're losing that sense of inspiration in the practice. And uh, I just wanted to point out as well that the Buddha taught the middle way, and sometimes this is understood wrongly as somewhere between these two, some sort of neutral space that's not um, trying too hard, but neither is it indulgence. It's somewhere in the middle of those two extremes. And this can sound like quite a kind of flat or dull kind of space, you know, a kind of unfeeling space. And that's actually not what the Buddha was pointing to at all. He was saying that the middle way doesn't lie between these two extremes, 
but it goes in a completely different direction. So rather than out into the sensual world, either through rejecting it or indulging in it, the middle way is a path going inwards, going into where we already are, <clears throat> not trying to get to something better, not trying to push away what we don't like, but actually turning inwards to this moment, you know, in a deeply compassionate, spacious and patient way. So the middle way is actually very counterintuitive. It's going inwards to the pleasures of the mind. And this is what I want to talk about today, about the pleasures of meditation, the pleasures of the mind that happen through a causal process. And one of the links in that causal process is confidence in the teachings. So the Buddha talked about this middle way um, also as the four jhanas, very interestingly, which are very, very different kinds of happiness. They're an extremely refined kind of happiness that's based on renunciation, based on seclusion, and based on peace. This is the bliss of renunciation, the bliss of seclusion, and the bliss of peace. And again, the jhanas, the deep states of meditation, are not something that we attain through will. They're something that happens through a causal sequence when we learn how to put the causes for their arising in place. So this is another aspect of right view. One aspect of right view, the first factor of the noble path, is understanding, or at least having some appreciation of the fact of suffering and that suffering is to be understood and there can be an end to suffering when we uproot this craving in the mind. But also this idea of actions having consequences. Yeah? Our actions have very immediate consequences for others and for ourselves and we start to see that much more clearly through our practice. We start to see in our mind you know, when we do develop a sense of impatience with ourselves or with the practice, um, that it hardens the mind, that even can manifest in tension in the body, right? And we notice that we're moving away from our center point of peace. We're moving away from contentment, yeah? So we start to notice this in our practice and also, of course, in life. You know, when our actions stem from compassion, from loving kindness, when they're motivated by generosity rather than greed, we actually bring value to other people's lives. People feel um, safe around us. They know that we're um, genuinely interested in their well-being. And our practice becomes much broader, not just for our own liberation, but to help others as well. And we start to understand that, you know, it doesn't matter who we are. It doesn't matter what your race, your gender... Um, your idea of your ability or lack of ability. It doesn't matter whether you've had success, so-called success in meditation before or not. You know, the process happens when the conditions are right for it to happen, not when we want it to. My own teacher, Ajahn Brown, is a very senior monk and he's renowned for his um, deep meditation practice and wisdom and compassion as well, because wisdom and compassion go together. And it's very difficult sometimes as monastics to talk about our own meditation because there are certain rules that don't allow. So sometimes, you know, people want to know, so do you attain these states of deep meditation? How enlightened are you on the path? And uh, we're not allowed to tell lay people for a very good reason, because if we were to do that, then it could lead to corruption in the Sangha, you know, to be easy to get more support, for example. You know, people want to support good monks and nuns who they feel are enlightened or at least part way there, right? And so you can imagine how that could lead to a lot of exaggeration or just a very kind of unpleasant idea of giving only to those who have deep practice and ignoring those who don't. Um, so we're not allowed to talk about this, but there is a caveat, which is that we can tell other monks and nuns. And even there, I mean, my own teacher advises me not to do this unless it's with my own teacher. And I, I really take that to heart, you know, because, again, this isn't about a sense of self or getting some kind of accolade for oneself. The path is actually about the sense of self-disappearing. So Ajahn Brown went to Sri Lanka one time and he was in quite an awkward situation where some senior monks asked him, so come on, you know, Ajahn Brown, 
you talk about jhana, you talk about the bliss of meditation, you even talk about some of the deep insights on the path. Can you, Ajahn Brahm, attain the jhanas? And he had to think very quickly on his feet. And he came up with a really lovely response. He said, Ajahn Brahm cannot enter jhana. So for a moment there, everybody was, oh, is our teacher a hypocrite? <laughs> what has he been saying all these years? Even he can't do it. What is the chance for us? And then he gave the reply. He said, Ajahn Brahm has to disappear, and then only jhana can happen. And this is true for so much of the path. You know, Our sense of self needs to diminish first before we can start to attune with the, path, with the path and have confidence in that, in and of itself. So how does confidence lead to these deeper states of meditation? And uh, for this, I wanted to talk about a beautiful causal sequence that's found in the Anguttara and Nikaya. And it's found in two places. One of them is called the Upanissa Sutta, um, called Volition. And it talks about a causal sequence that starts from suffering, which I find deeply reassuring and brings huge amounts of confidence and faith. So most of the time when we hear about causal sequences in, in Buddhism, it's about the cause of suffering, what leads to suffering, how this whole thing began. But basically, it already began, right, through delusion. We got this human birth, we have to encounter loss, we have to encounter sickness, etc. There's very little we can do about that. But there's another causal sequence, which is sometimes described as transcendental liberation or transcendental dependent origination. And this starts from that place of suffering. And suffering can lead to confidence for one who comes in contact with the teachings of the Dhamma. We hear the teachings, first of all, through hopefully our spiritual friends or through reading the suttas, and we get confidence in that. And that confidence gives us the ability to start putting in the causes, to start taking steps on the path. So we become much more invested in the causes than in the results. One of the things this then manifests in is the wish to live a virtuous life for its own sake, because we realize that virtue by itself is a source of freedom, it's a source of happiness. The Buddha called virtue a kind of pleasure, anavajasukha, it's blameless bliss, it's the bliss of non-remorse, non-regret. Sometimes we miss this, you know, again, it's an absence of something, it's an absence maybe of guilt or of, um, you know, remorse, regret just lamenting over things we've done in the past that really ties the mind down and burdens us with um, this heavy sense of things not quite being right. Just having the absence of regret and remorse is already a kind of happiness. But the Buddha doesn't stop there because sila, the practice of virtue, is also active. It's also something we can do. You know, we can learn how to be kinder, more generous. We can learn how to serve. You know, the meditation really takes off when we start, as I said, to think about others as well. And for myself, it was when I started to serve on retreats that my practice gained in strength and momentum. It gave me a lot of inspiration, a lot of motivation to keep on developing my own mind because I could see that this could then contribute to giving opportunities to others to do the same. And that service was an immense source of joy. It also took away that burden of time and that feeling of needing to practice for my own liberation. Whenever I thought, you know, I could see my practice was becoming a little bit tight and I was worried about, am I doing it right? I would then decide to serve a retreat. And I'd see that just as I had, you know, certain emotions that I still struggled with, certain patterns that seemed deeply ingrained, all beings have this too. And these were people from every walk of life. You know, a lot of this service was in India and Nepal and countries where you know, a lot of um, international people would come to as well. And no matter their background, no matter their race, no matter their gender, the human mind was the human mind. You know, it had its own struggles, its own capacity for joy. And it really depersonalized this process and gave me a lot of happiness, a feeling of meaning in life. 
this alone is not enough. We also need to reflect on our own goodness, on our own virtue. And this is called Chaganusati in the Buddhist texts. It's actually bringing up our kindness, our generosity, um, you know, our truth, perhaps our capacity or willingness to make mistakes but keep on trying and to reflect on this in a really beautiful way, to bring up a sense of happiness, a sense of gladness in the mind. And this is actually not an egotistical thing to do. Sometimes there's quite a deep resistance to this because we think it's going to kind of embellish the sense of self. But rather what it actually does is deepen our understanding, again, of cause and effect, of how when we do act with kindness, it has results that are beautiful, beautiful here and now, and that have consequences for others as well. So we become much more eager to put those causes in place. To give you an example of this, I'd like to read a little story from a a book about my teacher, Ajahn Brahm. And uh, this is interesting in the sense that it's about virtue, but it's also about a shift in perspective from a results-oriented practice to a practice that focuses on conditions. And if my practice has changed at all over these last, okay, 28 years, I can probably say this is one of the main ways that it's changed, being less concerned with the results and putting more joy, more love, more energy and patience into putting down the conditions for practice to happen on its own. So this is a a very nice story from 1991, where there was a big bushfire that swept through the monastery Bodhinyana in Perth. And this was a monastery that uh, my teacher, Ajahn Brown, had himself been instrumental in building, brick by brick. He'd actually taught himself how to lay bricks, how to climb really, really steep ladders and uh, build the Dharma Hall. And this had been a labour of love. It had been, in a sense, his life's work, you know, his way of serving to develop a community, to develop conditions for others to practice and experience the freedom that he'd experienced for himself. And in 1991, there was a massive bushfire that basically ripped through the monastery to the point where all the trees were destroyed. They were just... It was one of the crown bushfires. It's called a crown bushfire because it it kind of burns up the trunks of the trees right into the leaves. And it's very ferocious. It can even create something called, um, uh, what do they call them, fireballs. Because of the oil in the eucalyptus leaves, they actually sort of shoot up into the sky and kind of spread through the sky in these balls of fire. And even a spark from one of these can travel up to 30 kilometres and destroy everything in its wake. So I lived in Perth for about four years, and whenever there would be a very strong likelihood of a a bushfire like this, there was an emergency warning and we would have to evacuate, even before a fire came close, because they could jump such long distances. So in this case, um, they had to evacuate. And they went down to the city and heard the news that the fire had actually swept through the monastery. And at this point, my teacher knew the monastery is destroyed. And the interesting point about it was, somebody asked him, you know, at that time, how did you feel? And this is what he said. He said, at that moment, I knew the monastery was burnt down. It would be no more. But I also knew that the following morning, With the fire gone and only ashes left, I would return and start building it again from scratch. How is this possible? You know, what kind of renunciation and letting go could lead to this? So he said, I was able to let go because I was not interested in the results. The outcome was not the point. My main purpose had not been to build a beautiful monastery. Instead, I did it because it was a good thing to do. I did it as an act of generosity, an act of compassion and kindness for the world. As soon as it had burned down, I would be able to continue practicing that kindness on the very next day by starting the rebuilding process. You see, the fire did not take anything away from me because I, everything I'd done, I'd done for a very different purpose. It was to build up good spiritual qualities inside 
and those qualities were still there. And I would have the chance to continue building up the same good spiritual qualities on the following day. Isn't this an extraordinary example of patience? I find this deeply inspiring, and I hope that you do too. If we could only approach our spiritual practice in the same way that we were practicing just for the sake of developing these beautiful qualities inside, then the results by themselves would almost be immaterial, but they would manifest right there. So sila leads by itself to joy. And there's a beautiful uh, simile for this causal sequence. It goes from suffering to confidence to joy and then to rapture, which is the meditative bliss that can arise in the mind. And from rapture to tranquility, to pasadi. From tranquility to happiness, deep inner happiness, sukha. From deep inner happiness to stillness or samadhi. And these are defined as the states of jhana. And from samadhi to seeing things as they really are. So all the way from suffering through confidence as the pivotal turning point, right into the deepest insights on the path. So there's a lovely um, simile, as I said, which goes something like this. It says, just as heavy raindrops fall on the top of a mountain and fill up the creeks and the gullies and the clefts, these by themselves fill up the streams The streams becoming full fill up the pools. The pools becoming full fill up the ponds. The ponds becoming full fill up the rivers. And the rivers becoming full fill up the oceans. In the same way, from confidence, when confidence becomes full, it gives rise to joy quite naturally. And there's another beautiful sequence in the suttas that goes one step further by saying, There's no need to make the volition make confidence lead to joy because it's natural that one with confidence experiences joy. It cannot be done by an act of will. When joy arises in the mind, there's no need to make the volition make rapture arise. It's natural that one with joy experiences rapture. So not only is there no need to make a volition, but it actually cannot be done by an act of will. This is the preferred translation of my teacher, Ajahn Blamali, that it cannot be done by an act of will. It's entirely a sequence of cause and effect. And the more you deepen the practice and allow these beautiful states to arise, the more you see how the sense of self is what messes things up. Many times for me, I've been experiencing a sort of very subtle meditative joy And I've noticed that the more I can just yield to it and let go and allow it to happen, the more it deepens. It's as though the more I vanish, the less fabricated things become. And the more the Dhamma has a chance to manifest its beauty, its peace. And as I said in the beginning, sometimes it's at this point that we lose our patience. The sense of self doesn't like not being involved, so it tries to interfere just to show it's still around. You know, sometimes it can manifest just as a sense of, what next? You know, what's going to happen next? Maybe some lights are going to arise in the mind, or maybe this is going to lead to really deep meditation. And it can be subverbal. It's usually subverbal by this stage. It's just that sense of anticipation that takes us out of the moment. We start waiting in the future for something to happen instead of being content where we are. So this joy starts to arise precisely because this process has started of letting go, of surrendering to the process, of trusting in the process. When we already have a sense of joy and gladness in our mind, we sit to meditate and feel fairly relaxed already. Sometimes it's difficult to establish mindfulness because we haven't done the foundational work. You know, we still have regrets, we still have remorse, there's unfinished business to be done and it keeps on banging away in the mind, you know. Or we haven't developed enough um, gentleness so that if suffering does arise, we fight it rather than letting it be. 
But if we can live beautiful lives and really focus on these foundational practices of virtue and bringing up the goodness within ourselves, then by the time we meditate, we already have a fairly clear and light mind. And it's just a matter of time before joy starts to arise. And we have to give it that time. So sometimes if we're impatient, the bliss can actually recede and we find ourselves right back at the beginning, you know. Or sometimes we interrupt the process just by thinking a little bit. Have you noticed how thoughts just seem to arise from nowhere and pop into the mind just as you're getting still? This is also a manifestation of the sense of self as the doer, you know, this agent that wants to kind of have its own commentary on things. So one of the uh, really lovely instructions I once received in a Rains retreat when I was experiencing a lot of joy and bliss inside was surprising to me because it was about patience. And the instruction was to endure the bliss. <laughs> and I think this sounds kind of maybe quite strange for people who haven't experienced this yet in meditation, but sometimes we're actually averse to happiness, perhaps because of a sense of guilt often because of a sense that, you know, we need to work hard for it, maybe I don't yet deserve it, I haven't done enough. You know, how can I be happy when other people in the world are suffering? How is this contributing at all? But sometimes it's just because it leaves us feeling a little bit out of control. It's new territory, new grounds that we're not familiar with. And we've yet to become accustomed to it. Sometimes we're looking for something special, you know, we're looking for the fireworks, we're looking for kind of the very strong, pulsing bliss that courses throughout the body. But PT, meditative rapture, can be something much quieter than that, much more subtle. Once when I was meditating, I was working with the breath, and, you know, the breath was there, it was kind of peaceful, it was quite um, still, there weren't too many thoughts going through the mind. And I just remembered this idea of perception, of just noticing the happiness that is there instead of looking for something else. And as soon as I remembered to notice the peace, to notice the bliss, it was as though it filled up the entire body and mind, almost in an instant. It was just that slight shift of perception, that tuning up to a different frequency, if you like, that allowed that to manifest in a very beautiful way that kept the mind um, in a way very still with its object for a long, long period of time. So this is the point in meditation where it becomes easy to sustain the awareness because we're enjoying what we're doing. Yeah, we don't have to use any force at all. If we have to use force to hold the breath, then it's probably not because you're not doing it right, but because you haven't done enough of the foundational preparation. You haven't developed enough joy. So then we can look at our own conduct, we can look at our sila, we can look at ways to bring more joy into our life. You know, yesterday I taught a little bit about loving kindness as a very beautiful, skillful means to begin our meditation. But it can also be a practice that leads into stillness very effectively, very easily, simply because it contains so much joy. So if we practice this more regularly, it not only helps to overcome the hindrances of ill will, the hindrance of impatience, of boredom, etc. It also gives us a sense that we are doing something for others, we're serving in some way. And that can really help to sustain our interest, to sustain the motivation and the confidence in our practice, and to give rise to the joy you know, when the mind is joyful, it's also energised. So we can sit for much longer without getting tired. Yahel said yesterday that, you know, many of you may, may experience not being able to sleep. You know, simply because the mind is starting to, to energise. You're not using so much of that energy on thinking or controlling or manipulating life. And so the energies of the mind start to arise. So the best thing we can do at this point in the meditation, and honestly at most of the points, the, the longer I practice, the more I realise it's better if I can do less. The less I do, the more I clear the way for the process to happen on its own. But if we can keep really still at this point, 
then this will feed into the next stage of tranquility. Yeah? This is the best thing we can do. People often say, what do I do when bliss arises? What do I do if a light comes to mind? The best thing you can do is stay very, very quiet, very, very still, and just allow the process to keep unfolding in its own time. The more we interfere, the more we slow down the process of meditation. So it's this confidence in the teachings that allows us to step back and for the Dhamma to manifest itself. So the mind tends to quieten further on its own, almost when we've drunk our fill. You know, for most of us, we're not accustomed to tuning into the happiness in the body, whether it manifests as pleasant sensations, physical sensations, or the happiness in the mind. You know, we're much more familiar with focusing on the faults, you know, honing in on the difficult areas, um, trying to work with, you know, the pain. And... uh, It's difficult sometimes for us to allow the pleasure of meditation. So sometimes we need to get familiar with that for quite a long time and actually allow ourselves to really be bathed in the happiness, to really soak it in and embody it, if you like. And once we've done that for a certain amount of time, it's as though the body and mind need the nourishment of PT. And eventually, when we've drunk our fill, it can quieten down. Eventually, we start to feel that even the PT is a little bit coarse. It's a little bit agitating for the mind. And so it naturally starts to quieten. And this stage of pasadi is likened to sitting under a tree. You know, you've been out in the sunshine. Maybe you've been enjoying it. It's been lovely. It's been joyful. But now you feel like just resting in the shade of a tree for a while. So it's a quieter sense of joy in the mind. And the body becomes so tranquil at this point that it might even start to disappear. At least the seeming apparent solidity of the body starts to soften. And sometimes parts of the body vanish altogether. And perhaps if you're working with the breath, the breath becomes more manifest. um, As though the breath fills up the body. And uh, in a sense, the body dissolves. So the pasadi enables us to sit for long periods of time without any effort, not because um, you're forcing it, not because you're gritting your teeth, certainly you're not enduring the pain. At this time, the body's very light, and the mind becomes increasingly peaceful. And this turns into what's called sukha, remember, without making any will at all. And sukha is a kind of deep inner contentment. It's the happiness of peace. Remember, the proximate cause for this kind of happiness is that tranquility. So it's a happiness that's quite distinct from the sensual desire. It's the happiness of the mind. We're turning inwards towards this. And we're letting go of the sensory world. You know, we might even start to lose the sense of hearing. You know, sounds seem to be very far away. You know, we already have closed our eyes, so there's no sense of um, seeing, but even the sense of touch becomes very, very subtle at this time. And the happiness starts to well up from the mind itself. I was saying to Yahel this morning, and this is um, only a very gross example of this, but uh, quite often I'm in quite a bit of physical discomfort because of a chronic gastric condition. And uh, last night I didn't sleep very well because of this. So this morning it was quite aggravated and I had a lot of nausea. You can probably hear that my throat is a little bit um, hoarse. And in the past I used to think it's because I talk a lot. (laughs) But it's actually the acid reflux that um, comes up into the throat. And, you know, there can be a headache, there can be all kinds of physical discomfort. So when somebody asks me how I am, at first, you know, I'm not quite sure how to reply Because there's a very big difference between how the body is and how the mind feels. You know, physically, I don't feel so great, but mentally, I feel quite joyful. So in that sense, I'm really enjoying the retreat. I'm enjoying the experience of teaching. I'm enjoying the experience of sharing the Dhamma, hearing my wonderful co-teacher share his wisdom and experience in the Dhamma, and giving the opportunity for other people to practice. So there's a very subtle, sometimes we don't notice the difference because obviously the body and mind affect each other, right? We do have less energy when the body is sick and sometimes that equates to less mental energy too. 
But still, there is a subtle difference in the body and the mind, in the sense of the body can be suffering, but the mind can be well, the mind can be bright. Yeah. And it's important to notice this in your meditation too, because sometimes when um, some of this happiness arises, we can feel that it's in the body, but it's actually a manifestation of the purification of the mind. You might be feeling it in the body, but feeling is a part of the mind. So the more we can start to tune into the mental pleasure, the more we can deepen the meditation and actually go beyond this five sense world into really deep samadhi. So the next stage after this happiness, which is actually likened to plunging in a beautiful lake, a simile that mainly applies, I think, in a hot country. So you can imagine that it's a hot, steamy day in England or maybe in the tropics. You know, and you're thirsty, you're parched, you're really tired and sweaty, and you see a beautiful lake. First of all, you sit on the side in the shade. Secondly, you plunge in. So it's a sense of immersive happiness. You know, it's uh, completely uh, all-consuming, if you like. And then we enter these deep states of samadhi. And these are states of very, very deep stillness. You know, you can be sitting for many, many hours, and time just has no meaning anymore. And there's no need for patience, there's no need for any kind of will. In fact, this doing part of the mind is temporarily disabled or suspended, and you're completely at one with the object, you're completely at one inside. So this is when sustained awareness is very, very natural. And this is precisely because the five hindrances have been overcome. So the desire, the ill will, the doubt, yeah, you had a lot of confidence to begin with, but now doubt is completely overcome. Any kind of tiredness or sloth and torpor is overcome at this point. And the mind is very, very steady, very, very quiet, and full of bliss. And there's a consequence of this. You know, this is not just for the sake of learning more about happiness and learning um, the path of meditation, learning how to find that peace inside. It's also because we need to remove the hindrances from the mind in order to see things as they really are. As long as the hindrances are still manifesting, are still operating, they weaken wisdom. They weaken our capacity to see things as they are. You know, whenever we see things through a lens of craving, we focus only on those things that tend to stimulate that craving. You know, when the mind has aversion, we only see the faults in another person or the faults in ourselves. Now, for the first time, we have genuine sense of freedom of inquiry. We're actually able to see things more in alignment with how they are. And this is not in any ultimate sense necessarily at this point, but at least we have a freedom of inquiry. We have a flexibility we have a malleability of the mind. And this is one of the places in the suttas where the Buddha describes the mind as soft. It's the mind that comes out from deep meditation, the mind that's free from hindrances, that is mudu, that is soft. So at this point, we can stay with our experience for many, many hours, for as long as it takes for the Dhamma to reveal itself. You know, all those causes for impatience have been removed. And now we have an opportunity to go deeper and deeper into this reality and see things in different ways, see things in ways we didn't expect to see them. Sometimes this is difficult, especially for experienced meditators. We already think we understand impermanence. We think we understand non-self to some degree. And this can also be a barrier to seeing things anew. So it's at this point that we have, I guess, what you could call a genuine beginner's mind. And we have an opportunity for the Dhamma to arise, to see things as they are, to see things in a way that frees the mind. And I've met people who have, you know, experience non-self and who understand the, um, how the sense of self is fabricated. And it's interesting to me that these are people with incredible patience for everybody and everything. Precisely because they know that there's nobody in there doing this. 
they can regard others also as completely able to follow the same path. There's nothing in any of us that prevents us from understanding suffering in its entirety and also finding a way out. It's simply a matter of finding a way to put the causes in place. And to this extent, some wisdom is needed. And a lot of the wisdom comes from just listening to the Dhamma, from hearing the teachings and from confidence arising. So, this is a little talk, maybe not so coherent. Please excuse me because I am quite tired. But hopefully to inspire you all into knowing that freedom is possible and suffering does have a meaning and it's possible to enjoy the process along the way. This path is a path of happiness, of ever-refined happiness and stillness. And it can start with suffering. This is the beauty. It can make meaning of that suffering for us and give us an opportunity to develop the deepest kind of compassion that understands that we're not perfect, that others are not perfect, that life is not perfect, it's never going to be, but that we can develop ourselves, we can live lives of virtue, we can live lives of deep meaning that have beneficial effects for ourselves and others and that can enable us to see things as they truly are. So I do encourage you to develop the happiness of virtue and the happiness of meditation. <laughs>